Olympus makes it more convenient to generate style sheets using SAS by providing you with useful mix-ins, functions, and more. And with the new Compass Rails gem, it's easier than ever to integrate with the Rails asset pipeline. Let me show you. Here I have a simplified version of the Railscast site design, and I would like to use Compass to improve the underlying styling for this application. To add Compass to a Rails app, just go under the Assets group in your gem file and add the Compass Rails gem into here, and you'll need to make sure to run the bundle command to install it. Next, go into your app assets style sheets directory and rename the application CSS file so that you add the .scss extension to it. This turns it into a SAS interpreted file. Now this is necessary so that we have a centralized location where we can load Compass in and then share it across all other SAS files. Sprockets doesn't give us that flexibility, so we don't want to use Sprockets to load our style sheet files, so I'm just going to delete the manifest here. And instead, I'm going to use SAS to import the necessary files. So first I'll load in Compass here, and then I can load in any other files inside of my project, such as this layout SAS file. I'll just pass in layout there. Now you may need to restart your Rails app for it to pick up the Compass gem, but then after that and reloading the application, it looks the same. And that's what we want, because now we have the ability to use Compass to improve our SAS. Now when I added that import Compass line to my application, it provides the following Compass features, including making it more convenient to work with CSS3, so I don't have to specify all of the browser vendor prefixes for doing a border radius or a box shadow and so on. Now in my application, I'm using a gradient, and gradients are documented under the images section, and here you can see how to use Compass to add a CSS3 gradient. Well, let's try this out. Let's use Compass to generate the gradient in this navigation bar. And you can see that styling is handled by my layout SAS file. Under a navbar section, you can see the gradient is handled right here, and I'm currently specifying all these browser vendor prefixes. But with Compass, I don't need to do that anymore. Instead, to use Compass, I just need to prefix this with include, and then pass in uh, the linear gradient as an argument into a background image like this, and it will do the same thing but generate all the browser vendor prefixes for me. And now we could try this out by reloading this page, and our gradient still looks good here in Safari, and if we check out our generated application CSS file, you can see all the gradients are present here for all the browser vendor prefixes. It works. Now if all you need out of Compass are these CSS3 conveniences, you may want to use Bourbon instead, like I show in episode 330. But Compass provides a whole lot more, including CSS sprites. First of all, what are CSS sprites? Well, you can see on this page there are several icons here for subscribing to Railscasts in a variety of ways, such as iTunes, Twitter, and so on. And if you view the resources for this page, you can see each of these icons is a separate image. Now, each of these will require a separate request to fetch the image, and generally you want to reduce the number of requests made by the client on a given page. So if we merge all these icons down into a single image, it will just perform one request, and then we can selectively choose which part of that image to show for each icon using CSS. So that's how CSS sprites work. It's a pain to do manually, but it's very easy with Compass. Let me show you. Now if you check out the layout style sheet, you can see the icon images are currently being handled by background image in CSS. I'm using image URL here to point to the proper icon uh, under the assets images icons directory here. Now the first step, if you haven't already, is to take all the images that you want to merge into a single sprite image and place them all in a directory like I have here. Next, you can load the images into Compass by calling import and then passing in the path. In this case, icon slash everything dot ping. And then that will load up all the images under this icons directory here and make a single sprite image. And then there are a couple of different ways that you can use this. I'll show you the more manual approach first, and that is to go wherever you are using a background image for the icon, like I am here, and then replacing that with a call to include, and then you want to specify the name of the, the directory that the images are under, in this case icons, and then dash sprite, and then the name of the file, in this case iTunes. And so you'll do that for each one here. There we go, that looks good. Now let's see what this did in the browser. Now reloading the page looks the same for the icons, but if we check the resources, you can see that all of the icons are now merged down to a single image, so it can pull them all down with a single request, and then pull out the parts that it needs using CSS. 
Now, Compass provides a more convenient way to do this. Instead of loading each of these sprites individually into a separate CSS class like this, we can do it all through Compass. So we no longer need to reference this all here, and instead, under this import line, we can just say include, and then all, dash, and then the name of the directory, in this case icons, then dash sprites. So this will automatically make a separate CSS class for us for each of these images. We'll just need to change the HTML to reference them. So here's what my layout file looks like where I'm displaying those icons. And I just need to change the class here to use the class that Compass generates. And that's very easy. It's just prefixed with the name of the directory, in this case icons, and then dash, and then the name of the image, such as iTunes. And we'll just change the rest of these as well so that they match what Compass generates. And now if I reload the page here, you can see it still looks the same with all the icons. And if I check out the generated application CSS file, uh, you can see all the classes are here defined, referencing the proper portion of that image in CSS. For more information on sprites, check out the Spriting with Compass tutorial. And really, all the documentation on Compass is pretty good, so just browsing around the Reference and Help section is a great way to sort of get an idea of what else Compass provides because there are a lot of little miscellaneous utility functions that are really useful. For example, under Utilities Lists here, there's a Horizontal List feature that I find quite useful because Horizontal Lists are something you need to do quite frequently to change a list into maybe a navigation menu, so you can just include this Horizontal List uh, mix-in. This is something that I do in this application where I have this Horizontal class that just displays a list of items horizontally for navigation menus, and so I can just replace this CSS code here with a call to include horizontal uh, list, and then Compass will handle it for me. And reloading the page here, you can see wherever there's a horizontal list, which is the icons, and in the menu here, it still displays it horizontally. I may need to adjust some of the padding and spacing, but it got us mostly there. Now another useful feature is Compass Reset, because browsers may have different default values for sizing and spacing for various tags and a reset will set everything down to zero so you can build it back up to help make a consistent design between various browsers. To add this, just go to your application SAS file and then add a line in here to import compass slash reset. Now this is one of the few import compass commands that'll actually insert CSS code into your layout, so just be aware of that because it's going to clear out all the default values. So with that in place, watch this welcome h1 tag when I reload this page you can see that it stripped it back down to just normal plain text. Now, your, your site will probably look pretty bad right after you add the reset because uh, it's relying on browser defaults, but this way you can build it back up to look the way you want without relying on the defaults. So going into my layout SAS file, I might add something like this, where I define specifically how I want an H1 tag to look. And then reload the page, and we're back in business. Now I don't think CSS resets are necessarily a good thing all the time. I think for each project you just have to ask yourself how important it is that a design be consistent between browsers. For an alternative to Compass Reset, check out Normalize CSS. This has defaults that are closer in line to browser defaults, so you may not need to rebuild everything up from scratch. Well, that's it for this episode on Compass. Now many things I did not cover here, so check out the website for further details. For example, Compass comes with Blueprint, which is an entire CSS framework for building grid-based designs. Also, check out the README for the Compass Rails gem for some alternative approaches to integrate them together. And also, especially if you're using earlier versions of Rails, there's some caveats mentioned there. Finally, I want to mention that Compass is very modular, so even though it is a large framework, you can just choose to include and import the bits and pieces that you do use. Well. Thanks for watching this episode on Compass. I hope you find it useful. In the pro episode this week, I will show you how to deploy a Rails application from scratch to a VPS. There I will use Nginx, Unicorn, RubyEnv, Postgres, and more. So if you're struggling with deploying a Rails application and want a nice pattern to follow, check it out. To watch that episode and all other pro and revised episodes, just head on over to railscast.com pro and then sign up there for just $9 per month. In this episode, we're going to take a look at Active Model Serializers. This can be used to generate a JSON API in Rails. Let's try it out. 
Here I have a pretty standard blogging app with multiple articles, and each article has many comments. So what I want to do here is provide a JSON API to go along with this HTML view. So if I append the JSON extension in the URL, then I should gain access to the article's data. But right now I'm just getting this exception because our Rails app doesn't respond to the JSON format. That's easy enough to fix by going to the articles controller show action, which is what is being rendered. And let's add a respond to block here and provide the HTML format and the JSON format. And let's specify to render the JSON data of the article model. And now when I reload the page, I get that article's data in JSON. It works. So this is a pretty common way to generate a JSON API in Rails. However, you often need to further customize the output. Uh, you can do that by either passing options through here in the controller or overriding the asJSON method in the model. But both of those get messy pretty quickly. This is where tools like the Active Model Serializer gem come in handy. So let's go into the bottom of the gem file here and add the Active Model Serializer's gem and then you'll need to run the bundle command to install it. This gem provides a serializer generator, which you'll want to run for each model that you want to present through the API. If you're using the resource generator in Rails, it will make this automatically. So let's make an article a serializer. This just generates one file in the newly created app serializers directory. So now we have a dedicated class that we can use to fully customize the JSON output. And what's cool is that the gem includes hooks so that when we try to render out a model in a JSON format, it's going to automatically look for a serializer with the same name. So this will automatically detect the article serializer class and use that to render out the JSON format. In this class, we can specify which attributes we want to include in the output. Let's say the ID, name, and content of the article. Now after restarting my Rails app and reloading this page, I get the format rendered out through Active Model Serializers. Now you may have noticed there's one key difference here, and that is that all the attributes are included in a root node called article, which differs from how Rails generates JSON by default. Now you may not want this behavior depending on how you want the API to be consumed. You can disable the root node by passing in the root option and setting it to false. And now reloading the page, uh, we no longer have that root key. Now, if you want it to always behave this way everywhere, you can define a method called the default serializer options and then uh, set the root option or anything else in there. And then the active model serializer will automatically take that up so you could move this in the application controller so inheritance includes it in every place. I'm not going to do that here though. We're just going to stick with the default behavior of including the root node. Next, let's go back to our serializer class and see how we can further customize the output. Uh, perhaps we want to add some attributes into here which are not really methods defined on the model. For example, maybe we want to add the URL to the article in here. Well, we can define that as a method on the serializer and it will use that instead of delegating to the model. We also have access to the URL methods in here, so we can say article URL, and then pass in the object, which is going to be the model that this serializer is focused on. And reloading this page, and we include our URL attribute in our JSON output. I really like how you can just customize the attributes through methods like this. Uh, something else cool about the serializer is its support for associations. If we want to include the comments data in here, we can just say has many, comments because our article model has many comments. And now our JSON data includes the comments within our article attributes. And as you might expect, we can customize the comments attributes by generating another serializer called comment. So here's that generated serializer file and let's just keep this simple and include the comment ID and the content and reloading our JSON format, and our comments just include that output. So this is pretty cool. If a serializer class isn't found, it's just going to fall back to the Rails default serialization behavior. That means we can just add serializers as we need custom behavior. Now, so far, this comments data has been nested within this root article node. However, what if you don't want that? What if you want the comments data to be up at the root level as well? You might want to do this for performance reasons on some JavaScript client-side frameworks. We can customize that in our article serializer by calling embed and then uh, specifying IDs here. So that means any associations is just going to include the IDs within the article. However, we can tell it to include the comments data as well at the root level. And reloading this page, now our comments data is included at the top here outside of our article root node 
And we have our comment IDs attribute now, which includes those IDs. So this way we can keep our comments data separate and maybe only include it as needed. But it really depends on how you want the uh, API to be consumed. Now, what if there are some attributes that we want to include conditionally? For example, uh, let's say we want to add an edit URL, but only if the user is currently an admin. Well, we can't really do this through the attributes call here, but we can override the attributes method, and whatever hash is returned from here is going to be uh, converted to the JSON output. So if we want to keep our current behavior, we can call super to grab the data hash, and then we can just return that, and then modify it however we want. So let's add an edit URL attribute, and let's do the article URL here and pass in the object. Now I want to make this conditional, but let's try it out so far. Reloading our page, and we get our edit URL output here. So now we just need to make this conditional and only include it if the current user is an admin. However, the serializer is outside of the controller and view layer, so we can't simply say current user.admin here. To get around this problem, there's an object that's passed into every serializer called scope, and that defaults to the current user object. Let's give that a try, and we get this exception saying no method error, admin on nil. So scope is not set to the current user here for some reason. The issue is with how I have the current user method defined in my application controller. Here's that current user method, and for now I'm just simply uh, stubbing out the current user object using OpenStruct, which is kind of a handy way if you're just in the middle of development and don't want to add some authentication into your app. Anyway, this method is defined as private, which prevents Active Model Serializer from detecting it. So we could just change this to a protected instead, and let's try that. Reloading this page, and now it works again, and it doesn't include the edit URL because the current user is not considered an admin. So far, our serializer is working well, but I do have a few issues with how the scope works. One problem is that it's going to load the current user record every time it makes a JSON request in our application, even if the user record isn't accessed in the serializer. That can result in unnecessary database queries and potential performance issues. Another issue I have with this is that the name scope is so generic, it's not really obvious here that the admin method is called on the current user. Instead, I would much prefer if we can just call current user directly from here. To get this to work, we can customize the scope object that's passed into our serializers by going into the application controller and calling a method serialization scope and telling it to use something other than the current user, such as a view context. So this way we'll be able to call our current user through this view context and any other helper methods that we might need to access within our serializer. Now to finish this up, let's go back to our serializer and tell it to delegate the current user method to the scope, which will be the view context. So now if I reload this page, it has the same functionality, but our current user is now only loaded in as needed. Now one downside with this approach is that it can make testing a little more difficult because uh, you need to provide access to the entire view context for the serializer. Uh, to get around that problem, you might want to test it similar to how you would test helpers in Rails uh, by inheriting from ActionView test case if you're using test unit. This will automatically set up the view context for you so you can pass it into the serializer. Now I want to finish up with one more thing here, and that is what if we want to generate this JSON data outside of a JSON request? For example, on our articles index page here that lists out the articles, let's say we want to embed the JSON data for all these articles within the page itself. Well, here's that index template listing out the articles, and I often embed JSON content within a data attribute on a tag in the HTML. So let's call this data articles, and then set the content to the rendered version of the JSON. And this can be a little bit complex here, so I prefer to move this off into a helper method. Let's call it a JSON4, and then pass in the object that we want to serialize, in this case, the articles uh, relation. Now to save us some time, I'm just going to paste this method into the application helper, call JSON4, and accepts a target object, whether this be an active record relation or a model. And it sets the scope option for a serializer to self, so that's the view context, and a URL options because this is important to pass in so we don't get any errors about our host option being undefined. And then next we call active model serializer on the object that's being passed in. And this is a method that uh, the gem adds to uh, relations and models so that we can uh, determine what uh, serializer it should use. So we create that, pass in those options, and convert it to the JSON format. 
And now if we reload our page and view the source, our article data is passed in here uh, using the serializer to generate it. Cool. And that wraps up this episode on active model serializers. I encourage you to also check out episodes 320 and 322 where I cover JBuilder and Rabble respectively. Those generate JSON a little differently by utilizing view templates instead of serializer objects. I do think there are benefits to both approaches. I like the object-oriented nature of active model serializer. However, I also do like uh, the adjacent serialization to happen more in the view layer. There's no wrong answer here though, so just check out each option and see which one you prefer to generate your JSON APIs. Thanks for watching.